Seconds after takeoff from Washington DC, the pilots of a 737 struggle desperately to keep their plane in the air. 79 lives hang in the balance as their aircraft begins to slip towards the icy waters of the Potomac River. How did they get into this situation in the first place? And do they have any chance of making it out? This is the story of Air Florida Flight 90. On a wintry afternoon in January of 1982, 74 passengers and five crew boarded Air Florida Flight 90 at Washington DC's Reagan Airport. They had no idea as they boarded their Boeing 737 bound for Fort Lauderdale in Florida that their flight would become a cautionary tale against the dangers of flying in cold weather. A massive snowstorm was wreaking havoc for air travelers across the eastern half of the United States. Heavy snow and freezing conditions had led to lengthy delays and even airport closures. And Washington Reagan Airport, also known as National Airport, was no different. As the passengers boarded, the airport had closed for snow clearing operations. While not unusual for Washington DC in the winter, this weather was new to the pilots. Florida isn't called the Sunshine State for nothing, and both pilots were far more accustomed to flying in its Bamier climate. In command of the flight was 34-year-old Captain Larry Wheaton. Described by friends and colleagues as a quiet person, he was an experienced pilot with over 8,000 total flying hours. However, he had only recently transitioned to flying jets when he joined Air Florida two years previously. As with the passengers boarding Flight 90 that afternoon, they could not have known that they were entrusting their lives with a man who had a rather checkered flying record. In May of 1980, just two years previously, Wheaton had been suspended from flying after his performance was found to be unsatisfactory in the following important areas. Adherence to regulations, checklist usage, flight procedures such as departures and cruise control, and approaches and landings. That's a lot of areas to be deficient in. Pilots are tested regularly throughout their careers, and they don't all pass with flying colors, but to fail so badly that you're suspended is out of the ordinary. Wheaton resumed flying after passing a retest in August of 1980, but this wasn't the end of his troubles. Less than a year later, and less than a year before taking the controls of Flight 90, he received the grade unsatisfactory on a proficiency check at the airline, when he showed inadequate knowledge of memory items, aircraft systems, and aircraft limitations. He was rechecked three days later, when he passed. The relevance of this training background will become all too clear when we take a look at how the flight progressed in a moment. The first officer, by comparison, was by all accounts an excellent pilot. He was 31-year-old Roger Pettit. Pettit had accumulated nearly 3,500 flying hours in total, many of which were gained flying F-15s in the Air Force. Like the captain, he was relatively inexperienced flying passenger aircraft, with just under 1,000 hours flying the 737. He was described by friends and colleagues as a witty, bright and outgoing individual who had, quote, an excellent command of the physical and mental skill in aircraft piloting. Skilled though he was, Pettit shared the captain's inexperience in cold weather operations. In fact, he had flown just two flights in conditions similar to those on this day, while the captain had flown just eight. This lack of experience would play a decisive role in the events which we're about to see. The aircraft they were flying was a 12-year-old Boeing 737-200. While now an antiquated aircraft, with fewer than 50 still flying in the world as of 2023, the 737-200 was a staple of airline fleets in the US throughout the 1980s and 90s. It was a sturdy and capable aircraft, which was more than able for the weather it would encounter on this day. As the passengers settled in for the two and a half hour flight to Florida, they were anxious to get going. The flight was originally supposed to depart at a quarter past two, but with the runway closed until half past two, they would have to wait a while longer. And as they waited, a thick layer of snow had begun accumulating on the wings. This kind of weather is some of the most dangerous that an aircraft can encounter, far more so than turbulence or high winds. <laughs> 
the whole reason that planes can fly in the first place is because of the very particular shape of their wings. As such, even a small amount of ice on the wings can change the shape enough to make the plane unflyable. For this reason, with 10 minutes to go until the runway was due to reopen, Captain Wheaton called for the de-icing crew to come and spray down the aircraft. De-icing involves spraying the skin of the aircraft with a hot solution of glycol and water. This melts away any snow and ice which had accumulated on the wings and tail, and prevents more ice from forming. However, in extremely cold and snowy weather like this, a coating of de-icing fluid only lasts so long. The de-icing crew came to the aircraft and began spraying it down. But before they could get far, the pilots got the news that the airport would not in fact be reopening at half past two. Captain Wheaton told the de-icing crew to stop spraying the aircraft, as he wanted to de-ice the plane closer to takeoff, so that there would be less time for ice to accumulate on the wings. This was a prudent move, but its effect would be short-lived. The captain would soon make some decisions which would nullify the benefits of de-icing. As the crew waited for their new departure time, above them, dozens of aircraft were in holding patterns, waiting for the airport to reopen. There was now a traffic jam both in the air and on the ground, with scores of planes waiting to take off and land. And it was only getting worse. The pressures that this would create would end up adding to Flight 90's problems a few minutes from now. At a quarter to three that afternoon, the captain asked for the plane to be de-iced again, and another hot coating of de-icing fluid was applied. A few minutes later, the airport reopened, and Flight 90 received clearance to push back from the gate. The clock was now ticking. With every minute that passed, the de-icing fluid became less effective, as more snow built up on the wings. But, as is often the case in aviation, it's not the hazards alone that put the aircraft in danger, but the pilot's response to them. When the tug arrived at the aircraft and began trying to push it back, its wheels couldn't get any traction in the snow. Then Captain Wheaton had an idea, and for reasons we'll soon see, it would end up being one of the worst ideas of his career. He proposed to the tug operator that he would use the engine's reverse thrust to help push the aircraft back. The American Airlines tug operator told the captain that this was against American Airlines ground procedures in the snow. But the captain didn't care. He put the engines into reverse thrust and powered them up, blasting slush and snow forwards in an attempt to help the tug operator push the aircraft back. This had a highly dangerous effect, completely unbeknownst to either pilot. It melted some of the snow on the wings and redirected it forward onto the leading edge of the wings and on top of the engines, where it would refreeze as ice. Ice is far more dangerous than snow, and to top it off, this technique didn't even work. The plane wouldn't budge. The captain shut down the engines and waited for a properly equipped tug to arrive. When it did, 10 minutes later, the plane was pushed back as normal and the engines were started. But every second that passed, the water which was dripping down the leading edge of the wings was beginning to freeze. The pilots were eager to get moving towards the runway. A queue of aircraft was now forming, with Flight 90 11th in line for takeoff. Wheaton and Pettit rushed through the after-start checklist, with the first officer calling out the items and the captain checking that the switches were in the right positions. This is where the pilots made their next mistake. One of the checklist items involved the engine anti-ice system. When it's turned on, hot air is redirected around different parts of the engine, preventing ice from building up inside it. It's a crucial step in the checklist during winter operations like this. However, the pilots were so used to flying in warmer weather that when the first officer said anti-ice, the captain reflexively said, off. Neither pilot stopped to consider whether it made sense that in weather like this, the engine anti-ice system should be off. Indeed, if either of them had been asked about this on a test, or during a simulator scenario involving cold weather, 
they would not have made this mistake at all. But in the moment, they were going through the checklist almost out of muscle memory. They were speaking without thinking, and hearing without listening. Flight 90 now edged ever closer to disaster. The pilots received taxi instructions from air traffic control and began inching towards the runway in the heavy snow. Despite the danger, the atmosphere on board was light-hearted as the plane taxied out. One of the flight attendants called up the cockpit on the intercom, saying, I love it out here, and marvelled at the tyre tracks in the snow. The pilots and flight attendants chatted excitedly for a few minutes as the plane crawled forwards in the snow. None of them had seen weather like this before. As the snow continued to fall, the pilots began to get antsy about the danger of icing on the wings. First Officer Pettit commented that it had been a while since they had been de-iced. In fact, at this point, it had been almost an hour since they had been de-iced. And as each minute passed, more snow built up on the wings. But the pilots were in a bind. They were in the middle of a queue of aircraft waiting for their turn to take off. If they left the queue to go back and de-ice, they would lose their place in the line and have to spend the same amount of time queuing again, meaning that the same amount of snow would build up anyway. From where they stood, there wasn't much they could do. And besides, there were a dozen aircraft in front of them, each of which seemed to be taking off without issue. The captain turned around to look out behind him at the left wing, which he saw was covered in about a quarter to a half an inch of snow. The first officer looked back out his window and saw the same thing on his wing. But just then, as they inched forwards in the snow, Captain Wheaton had his second less than stellar idea of the day. In the line in front of him was a Douglas DC-9. The captain figured that with its rear-mounted engines, it would be able to blast some of the snow off the wings of his aircraft. He told his idea to the first officer, who said that it didn't really matter, because the snow would be blown off the tops of the wings anyway as they accelerated down the runway. And the sad truth was that he was right. There was no need for the pilots to use the exhaust of the aircraft in front of them to blow snow off their wings. In fact, doing this was expressly against the winter operations procedures they had been taught. Nonetheless, the captain began turning his aircraft so that the jet blast from the plane in front would blow over his wing. And then he turned it the other way, so that he could get the first officer's wing. This had a deadly effect. The snow on the wings melted and streamed backwards as water. Only now, it began to freeze and turn into ice. During takeoff, snow tends to blow off aircraft wings due to the high speed of the air rushing by. However, ice stays attached and critically disrupts the airflow over the wings. This is exactly why getting too close to an aircraft in front was prohibited during snowy conditions. But the captain either forgot this, owing to his lack of winter flying experience, or he chose to ignore it. As dangerous a blunder as this was though, it alone would not doom Flight 90. In fact, if it was the only mistake the pilots had made, they would not be in any great danger. As it turned out, it was a mistake they had made back at the gate, which would now come back to haunt them. First Officer Pettit noticed that the engine instruments for the left and right engines were showing different readings. For some reason, the EPR, or engine pressure ratio, on the right engine was lower than that of the left engine. The EPR is the ratio between the air pressure at the front of the engine and the air pressure at the back of the engine. It's how pilots measure the thrust output of their engines, because when they're at high power, the air in front of the engine is at low pressure because it's being sucked into the engine, and the air at the back of the engine is at a comparatively higher pressure because it's just being compressed by the engine and blasted out. In other words, when the engine is working at high power, the engine pressure ratio, the difference in pressure between the front and the back of the engine, is greater than when it's at lower power. The first officer figured that the lower EPR reading on the right engine was probably a result of the air from the plane's engine in front of him getting pushed into that engine, raising the pressure at the front of the engine while the pressure at the back remained the same, therefore lowering the ratio of the pressure at the front and at the back. 
This was a rational explanation. But in reality, this low reading was a sign of a much more serious problem. One which would put the lives of everybody on board in grave danger. The actual reason for the lower EPR reading on the right engine was that water which had been blown forwards by the pilot's use of the reverse thrust earlier had now frozen on top of the sensor in the front of the engine, causing the false readings. Right now, it was only affecting one engine, but before long, both engine instruments would show falsely high readings. If you think about it for a second, you'll see why falsely high readings can be treacherous on takeoff. If the pilots had simply turned the engine anti-ice system on at this point, this ice would have melted right off the sensor, and the normal readings would have returned. But the pilots simply never thought to do this. They had already completed the checklist, and they weren't about to return to it. As blasé as the pilots seemed to be about the weather, they were in fact quite aware of the dangers of icing. First Officer Pettit lamented the long waiting time for takeoff, and said that in these conditions, the icing just gave them a false sense of security. This is a loose map here on front of the ice. I give you a false feeling of security, that's all this is. I just, uh, The captain agreed, and said that really, there should be a de icing booth just before the runway. The first officer seconded this idea, which he likened to a car wash which planes could simply pass through just before lining up on the runway. This kind of system would in fact end up being adopted by airports in the following years, but unfortunately for the passengers and crew of Flight 90, it did not exist in 1982. As the planes slowly crawled forwards in the snow, the pilots continued chatting. The first officer commented about how the school kids must be delighted that they'd be off school tomorrow with all the snow. Both pilots were oblivious to the danger they were in. Ice had now blocked the sensors on both engines and caused them to display falsely high readings. Ice had also begun forming on the wings and crucially, it had started to build up on the wing tips, which on the 737 gave the plane some unusual and dangerous flying characteristics. The ice on the wing tips dramatically reduced the lift that they could provide meaning that the wing roots would provide proportionally more lift. And because the wings on jet aircraft are swept backwards, a greater amount of lift at the wing roots means the center of lift, which conceptually speaking is similar to the center of gravity, but just in the upward direction, moves forwards. This means that on takeoff, the plane would pitch up abruptly, catching the pilots by surprise. Meanwhile, the controller was still dealing with the scores of planes still on their way into the airport. He was keeping them close together on approach, so that he could get as many on the ground as possible, and ease congestion in the air. Flight 90 had now reached the front of the queue, and the controller wanted to get it airborne as soon as possible. The pressure was on for all involved. Captain Wheaton handed over control to the first officer, who was cleared to line up on the runway. The controller told the pilots to be ready for an immediate departure, as there was an aircraft coming into land just behind them. Pettit briefed the departure. The first officer was saying that after takeoff, he would keep the engines at high power to counteract the ice on the wings. The pilots were fully aware that the ice made things riskier, but they had no idea quite how bad it was. The controller told the plane on final approach to reduce its speed, as the Air Florida plane was now on the runway. This was against regulations, as planes should never be so close together that a plane on final approach needs to be asked to reduce its speed in order to avoid a collision. The controller then cleared Flight 90 for an immediate takeoff. The first officer pushed the throttles to take off thrust, but the engine indications swung way past the power he set. The captain chalked this up to it being really cold outside. What the crew didn't realise was that the cold air had very little to do with the erratic readings. They were in fact caused by ice on the engine inlet pressure sensors. The first officer pulled the thrust levers back 
so that the engine instruments displayed the usual takeoff power setting, not realising that in reality, he was now setting the levers at well below the thrust he needed. As the plane began accelerating slowly, Pettit realised that something was wrong. He could see that even though the EPR readings looked correct, the other engine instruments showed strange readings. But the captain disagreed. The first officer was right. The engine instruments were off. His plane was accelerating much more slowly than normal. But the captain was eager to get the plane into the air. The passenger jet close behind them had just been cleared to land. In fact, because of the controller's illegal clearances, it was already on the runway, bearing down on the pilots from behind. The pilots knew that if they aborted the takeoff because of the strange readings, the fast-moving jet behind them could collide with them, spelling disaster. But to the first officer, taking off seemed just as risky. The captain called out 120 knots, indicating that the plane was almost at the point of no return. Again, the first officer was hesitant. If it was up to him, he would probably have aborted the takeoff, just like other crews in similar positions had done before. But in 1982, only the captain could call for an aborted takeoff, and the captain of Flight 90 was hellbent on getting airborne. Finally, after a much longer takeoff run than normal, the plane reached rotation speed. The first officer pulled back on the control column, and the plane rapidly pitched up due to the accumulation of ice on the leading edge of the wings. This rapid lurch meant that the oncoming air was now hitting the underside of the aircraft. The pilot's stick shakers began vibrating their control columns violently, indicating that they were close to an aerodynamic stall and could fall out of the sky. The captain urged the first officer to push the nose down to gain speed. But it was no good. With the engines set to low power and a layer of ice on the wings, there was no way the plane was going to climb. It just about struggled up to 350 feet and then began slipping back down towards the icy waters of the Potomac River. The first officer tried desperately to keep the plane in the air, pitching down only as much as he needed to maintain speed, and finally slamming the thrust levers to maximum power. But it was too late. At one minute past four that afternoon, Air Florida Flight 90 smashed into the 14th Street Bridge connecting Washington and Arlington, and then plunged into the icy river below. In the minutes after the crash, just six survivors were found floating in the river. In the end, five of them were rescued alive. In all, 74 passengers and crew were killed, as well as four drivers on the bridge. The investigation carried out by the US National Transportation Safety Board found that ultimately, the crash of Flight 90 was a result of industry-wide problems in how icing conditions were dealt with, and a severe lack of winter weather training and experience on the part of the pilots. It also criticised Captain Wheaton specifically for making unprofessional decisions which ended up leading to the crash, including his use of reverse thrust at the gate, his failure to ensure that the engine anti-ice had been turned on, and ultimately, his decision not to abort the takeoff. It also criticised Air Florida for promoting him to captain and keeping him there, despite his failing to pass multiple proficiency checks. As a direct result of this crash, pilots nowadays receive far more extensive training on the dangers of icing. Many airports now have de-icing booths placed much closer to the runway, and de-icing fluids have been developed which are significantly more effective at preventing ice buildup. The attitude to cold weather operations has also changed dramatically within the airline industry. <laughs>
There is now a widespread healthy respect among both pilots and airport authorities for the threat that ice can pose to aircraft. These changes have made sure that winter operations nowadays are much safer than they were in previous decades. And accidents like this are nowadays almost non-existent. Special thanks to the Patreon and YouTube members for helping to make this video possible. If you'd like to see more of these videos, it would really help if you could support the channel on Patreon. I've put the link here on screen. I'd especially like to thank Joey, Steve Wilcox and Simon Burbage for their very generous support. Green Dot Aviation now has a Discord server. So if you'd like to join a growing community of people discussing all things aviation, just tap the link in the video description and I'll see you there. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you soon for the next episode.